Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, impact of our early, child, early education intervention on students' learning achievements in the Philippines. Uh, taking one example of a large uh, elementary school intervention implemented in 23 provinces in the Philippines. And uh, analytical side, uh, I'm going to use the propensity score matching uh, using a school panel data. The objective of this seminar, I mean, my presentation is twofold. Uh, first, I want to introduce our impact evaluation methodology, concepts and the methodology. Especially, uh, uh, we like to share the, the same understanding of the, con the concept of the counterfactual, uh, which is uh, very important when we understand the impact evaluation concepts and the methodology. And, and the second part, I'm going to talk about actual estimates of the impact of South Elementary Education Project. We call it TEEP. I don't know how many of you <laughs> actually heard about TEEP, but this was the, probably the largest school intervention implemented in the Philippine history. So I thought this is a good example for you here in the Philippines. Let me start from uh, some conceptual setting. <clears throat> Impact evaluation basically assesses the outcome for a specific program compared to the situation in the absence of the program. So this is uh, quite simple. We're going to compare what happened with the program and what happened without the program. All right. I would like to do a comparison, but this comparison is to understand. But actually, no, it's quite difficult if we start thinking very carefully. Let me introduce some notation first. Uh, then I'm going to explain why it is not so easy to conceptualize this kind of comparison. Uh, P denotes are basically the participation. It's an indicator for participation in the program. So if P takes one, it's a participation. Okay, and if P takes zero, uh, okay, it's a control group, not a participate. And S denotes outcome. Okay, P is a participation, S is the outcome. So S1, S1 is an outcome with a program, and the S0 is an outcome without program. So this notation is very easy to understand. So what is the impact of the program for unit I? Unit I can be household, individual, school, you know, the village, even country sometimes. But, okay, the, what is the income? impact? I'm sorry, impact. Impact is expected outcome when you participate in the program, but when you are treated with the program, minus expected outcome if there is no program implementation. The first part, this first time, is called after outcome. Yes, if you join the program, you have some outcome achievement. So that's observable. So that's actual outcome. The second term, what we call is what we call counterfactual outcome. Why do we call counterfactual? Because it's not observable. If I get married with one person, I cannot get married with another person. Okay. Second case is a counterfactual. It's it's not real. My wife is real. Okay. So that this kind of comparison is conceptually actually infeasible. I'm going to talk about deep implementation. If your school, if you are principal and in deep school, you can see the student outcome in your school because deep was implemented in your school. So, but the counterfactual outcome is what would happen to your school if deep was not implemented in your school? This is 
the unrealized. So it's not observable. But what we are interested in in impact assessment is the comparison between what actually observed when program was implemented in your place and what, what happened without program again in your place. You cannot be in the two states at the same time. So that oh, I said, excuse me. Second part is unrealized. It's not directly observable. But in any kind of impact assessment evaluation, we're interested in <coughs> counterfactual. We don't want to compare apple and orange. We don't want to compare different things to conclude something. We want to compare similar things. But in one case, there was a program implementation. In another case, the program was not implemented. OK, I will discuss this issue more, step by step. OK, so that uh, I kind of repeat the fundamental program in the impact evaluation is uh, counterfactual outcome is not observed. We cannot observe what will happen to somebody uh, who actually join in the program if the person didn't join the program. I think I'm confusing you, but uh, okay. But <coughs> there's an easy, naive solution. We can easily compare what happened to the program area and what happened to the non-program area. If they are similar, we can use, we can just substitute or use this one, this one. This is the expected outcome if the program was not implemented. Among the agents who didn't participate in the program, this is the example. This government, I mean, uh, the Philippine government has introduced the cash transfer program. If you receive cash transfer from the program, okay, that's observable. And also, you can observe the household who didn't receive the cash from the government. That's observable. They are different groups. What's not observable is our outcomes of the household who received the cash transfer. But, uh, okay, what would happen to them if they didn't receive the cash? But the reality is they received the cash. Okay, we can think about that uh, uh, the opposite situation as well. Naive solution, just using observable outcome of the comparison group or non-participant as a benchmark case, as compared to the outcome of the participants. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. <clears throat> when it works, if we can randomize the program in the population, in the exact sense, we can assume the equality, I mean the similarity between the participants and the non-participants, because the program was randomized. Once we can randomize the policy, uh, we can assume our naive solution can be a good solution for, I mean, <coughs> good representation of the counterfactual. But this is quite difficult to uh, implement because any policy has objective, which means government has a target criteria. Think about the cash transfer program. Okay, cash transfer is not distributed randomly uh, in the population. They target poor people, poor households, okay, with some conditions. So if targeting is uh, functioning, the policy is not randomized. And also there is an endogenous decision as well by economic agents. They choose to participate in sometimes. 
they choose not to participate sometimes. So this is not a random process. So in general, in the real situation, randomization is extremely difficult uh, to implement, and the government is not interested in this. So we have to understand how participants are selected into the program project, or how the, the program is implemented, or what is the target criteria the government is <coughs> thinking about. Let me try to visualize the <coughs> what's actually happening in the impact evaluation. <coughs> this is the before program, the situation before program implementation. And this is the after program. Okay. So time goes in this dimension. And the left this point, left part, is a participant. The dynamics along with the program implementation. So program is implemented here, and let's say they gain income because of the program. Then they achieve this income growth, let's say. How about non-participants? Non-participants can have a better income a higher income level in the beginning. Normally, government tries to help the poor households. So, the starting point for the program participants can be lower than the, the, the non participants. That really makes sense. And they have the same trend over time. If we don't Taking account the situation before the program implementation, we only compare, we only collect the data after implementation. So what we can observe is this. And then we can conclude the income gain from the program can be like this, this much. But even without the program, Everyone was experiencing this income growth. So, counterfactual situation for the participants, if the program was not implemented, but he or she didn't participate in the program, would be this guy. Without the program, even without the program, they had income growth. This is the proof, you know. <coughs> Oh, sorry, sorry. This income growth path is the same as income growth path for the non-participants. Because this group didn't have program exposure. So that uh, we can see the same trend. So the counterfactual unobserved situation for participants if the program was not implemented is this. So real impact is this part. So if we don't have <coughs> before and after, if we don't have a data from before and after the program, we are over extremely wise. The question is how to construct counterfactual situation. Because 
participating or not is observable from the data. So we know it, yes or no. And we know <coughs> their characteristics, participants as well as non-participants. Let's use the X uh, to denote uh, characteristics. So probability of participating in the program is just this probability. Conditional probability conditioned on observable characteristics. You may think about the unobservable characteristics as well, but that we, that's quite challenging to econometric things. So we estimate, first we estimate the probability, or let's say probing function or logic function, and then we have a predicted value of the probability of participating. <coughs> okay. So we can use these uh, to condition. The basic idea in the probability score matching is just to compare the participants and the non-participants that shares, who share the same probability. We have a participant and a non-participant. Team school and non-team school, let's say. And we know their characteristics. And once we estimate the probability function, then we can find agents, schools or households, okay, communities that have the same probability of participating in the program. Okay, someone participated in the program, someone didn't participate in the program. But in an ex ante sense, before the program was implemented, if they have the same probability of participating, okay, we are going back backward. Okay, we have a data, but we have to go backward before the program was implemented. And somehow, if we know those people have the same probability of participating in the program, we can visualize, we can imagine they they have to be similar before the program, but somehow. One group participated in the program, another group didn't participate in the program. But going backward before the program was implemented, if we know their probability of participating is the same, those people must be similar. So this is the basic idea. <coughs> and, and so the nice thing, good thing, of using probability, the probabilities are just one dimension. So we don't have to use a bunch of variables to condition. Let's skip this. Not only using probability of participation to condition, <coughs> we use a panel data in this study. Uh, but in general setting, let's assume we have a panel of data. And we have a baseline data corrected before the program. And the follow-up survey uh, is conducted to capture the outcome of the program. So before the intervention, we have this behavior equation. S is outcome. S is there. If, if, because the program was not implemented yet, so S0 is the outcome before the program. And it's a characteristics, observable characteristics. And the tips unobserved error component. And this is the unobserved, just a shock error component. Time varying error component. And after intervention, we have new term, which is the program impact. So what we need at the end to estimate is B or beta. <coughs> and other things are the same, except the time notation. And this is the outcome of the program. So we put one. In difference, in difference, or double difference method, we take a difference between the two equations so that uh, we look at the change in outcome here. And 
this is a change in capitalist things. And the good thing is that fixed, un unobserved fixed components is different now. So using this equation, we estimate P program input. The good thing is uh, of using a dif double difference methodology is uh, we can wipe out the correlation between uh, unobserved component and program. Which is normally biased in our estimates. So, by differencing, we don't have to worry about uh, the spurious correlation and the bias in the uh, deeper estimate. But still, we are comparing, we might be just comparing a different stuff treatment group and a comparison group. Maybe a very different group because of endogeneity of uh, programming. So we combine propensity matching and the double difference, D, to minimize the bias, potential bias in our estimates. Now, Let's try to, I mean, let, let me <coughs> explain the application of the methodology we just discussed, I just discussed in the Dipping Education setting. We use a, uh, okay, example is taken from the TEEP, South Elementary Education Program uh, in the Philippines. As I said before, this is the largest intervention to school education in the Philippines. Implemented in 2001, 2006, and TEEP has an integrated package of a school reform, school governance reform, and different kind of inputs in schools. And by nature, it has hard components and soft components. Hard components such as school building, construction, renovation, textbook distribution, and some equipment distribution. And the soft component is something like the teacher's training and school-based introduction of the school-based management, SDM. And the team was not randomized. OK, so, so we got a some randomization. Because the team was implemented in 23, the most depressed uh, provinces, school division. So it was not randomized. And also, what was implemented was quite different from what was planned. Uh, what I mean by this is uh, they planned, Department of Education planned three batches, three phases first group, second group, third group, sequential. They tried to start T in some group, first group, and two years later, second group, and the third group. But actually, uh, first batch and second batch were mixed because the group, those divisions in the first group were not ready yet in 2001. Then the second batch was supposed to start from 2002, 2003. Then first group, <coughs> some of the first group uh, divisions <coughs> started in 2001, but most of the divisions in the first group started in 2002. So from the impact evaluation viewpoint, this kind of messy implementation is not helpful. If they really implemented T in the first group in 2000 or 2001, and second group in 2003. Mm -hmm. This gap will help us identify the impact. Because the exposure to the T will be different between the two groups. In the first group, let's say, is exposed to the T longer than the second group. Mm -hmm. This gap will help us. But in reality, uh, the was the 
that the <coughs> uh, implementation, especially the first stage, were a little bit messy. So we cannot use this. But some study already published in the World Bank working paper, they use this, which is a tape. <laughs> then, uh, uh, okay, I, I mentioned about this. So tape has a hard component, the software component like this. And it was geographically distributed in this way. So this is a field team. And uh, in the song, most of the teams are concentrated in CAR, in a mountainous area. And uh, Nisaya, it was really scattered around. In a, I don't know why this kind of thing happened, but anyway, it's a, it looks good for me. And the team divisions in Mindanao are a little bit cluster. It's not really scattered on, you know, in the in, in island. Why, you know, I have a strong reason for saying Isaiah looks nice to me. Because, okay, if you look at Northern Song, okay, basically we need to compare team and non team. And we like to have the situation that the TIP and the non tip before TIP implementation, TIP and the non tip hope to be, I mean, they, we hope them, both groups, to be similar, comparable. But the reality in Northern Luzon is a little bit challenging because TIP is concentrated in one tennis area and non tip is outside mountain. So simply comparison is not really should, shouldn't work. Uh, we have to control conditions a lot econometrically. So we foresee this kind of challenge. Uh, we didn't use uh, Northern Luzon. But later I will mention we are collecting household data and student data. Uh, we are looking at individual achievements, long term income, but uh, using the school data in this current world, we decided not to use Northern Luzon. How about the desire? Desire looks like this. The teeth and the non teeth are really mixed together, scattered around, I mean, geographically speaking. Especially, they are located in, uh, you know, not in the cluster. For example, region 6, we have non T and T, and region 7, non T and T, and region A, like this, and Maspate, right? So, we can see the similarity of comparability of T and T. Okay, we want better to, better, it's, it's important to choose a sample which gives us similarity between program implemented area and non-program area before applying some methodology. This is very important. <coughs> How about Mindana? They are clustered. They don't look like a design. So we decided to not to use the Mindana in this analysis. Okay. And outcome variable is a national achievement test score uh, from school year 2002 3 to 2004 5. So there's a two year gap. And the good thing is, uh, this is a cohort panel. Grade, okay, first outcome is a grade 4 in school year 2002 3. And after two years, they become grade 6. Okay. We are looking at the same people. And then two, two years later, they become grade six, and we have a national achievement test score two. The team introduced NAT in grade four, five, six, targeting the same group. So why not taking advantage uh, of this? So we use a cohort panel. But this is a school level of average test score. 
then we use the overall score and the mathematics score. And the conditional in the variable. If you remember the p function, I wrote the p probability of p conditioned on x. And the variable x is taken from the census 2000 municipality income class 1 to 5. This is the income class distribution between T and non T in Visaya region, region 6, 7, 8. I don't know what you think, what you, you know, find from these two graphs. But for me, they look very similar. They're not very different, which is a surprising that to the government, maybe, but which is not surprising to me because if you go there, we know the similarity between the tip region and the non-tip region. We don't see a big difference between tip and non-tip. And since 2000 data, income class data, are showing, again, similarity. Of course, in tip divisions, districts, oh, okay, this is school districts. <laughs> Unit of observation is school districts. There are a little bit more school districts in income 4 and 5, income class 4 and 5, which is the poorer than average. And if you look at the income class 1, it's a town. <coughs> there are more school districts in non t region. How about the school level? Because we have to take into account the distribution of schools across the school divisions. Well, the the picture is the same, almost the same. We don't see much difference between the team and the non team, which is actually good news because I emphasized from the beginning that we like to con construct a counterfactual or a similar comparison group. Okay, because we believe comparison group or non team or non-participant group must be different from participant group. But the reality is, actually, non t and the teams are similar in the income demand, which is actually good news. Then uh, I question what was the targeting criteria the, the, this government was using. It was not really strict targeting. They just allocate the team in different you know, divisions. Not really using income criteria or property criteria. But for us, for research, uh, for researchers, this is a really good news. So we don't have to condition a lot on <coughs> condition T and not T on some observable characteristics. If we can use the income, uh, <coughs> probably that's enough to create a similar comparison. But this is a logic result. <coughs> so income level, municipality income level, is explaining quite significant. And we differentiate the impact by region. So in different region, we assume a different impact of a municipality income on participation, participation in the team program at school level. We also included pupil teacher ratio from 2002, uh, BIS database, and grade for total enrollment, the number of students in grade four, the number of multi-grade classes in 2002, proportion of local funded teachers as a total in 2002. So we condition participation, deep participation on these variables. So we estimate probability function. So using this outcome, we can construct the propensity score, which is the predicted probability of participating in deep. 
and conditioning on the probability, estimated probability. These uh, <coughs> characteristics, observable characteristics, become more comparable. We use uh, just a T statistic to compare the two distributions, it's one dimension. And this is an unconditioned comparison. We are not using proper as well. So they are different. Significant characteristics, let's say people teach a lecture and total number of grade four students and number of multi-grade classes, they are significantly different between the team and the non team before conditioning on the probability, before conditioning on the propensity score. Once we condition on the propensity score, these observable characteristics become comparable. There is no significant difference, statistically speaking. I didn't put the significant sum here, but uh, this is the standard error, and this is the point error. <coughs> so if you take a ratio, you get a T. And these are not statistically significant. They are not different. And this is the probability distribution. So probability of participating in T. So if we plot frequency or density, of propensity between okay in two groups, non T and T. <coughs> of course, because this group actually participated in T, they are selected into T. Probability, average probability is higher, higher than non T group. That makes sense because non T groups didn't actually participate in T. Our estimated probability is <coughs> concentrated here. On average, the probability of okay, <laughs> propensity score is higher in T group and lower than non T. That makes sense. Let's see the impact estimate. The first panel shows. Okay, this estimate doesn't use propensity score. We just take a difference in difference. Then this is the point of estimate. So over two years, from 2002 to 2004, student achievement measured by national achievement test score increased by 1.3 or 1.2. This is a low estimate without using propensity. So we are not actually okay. We are not constructing comparable non-T groups. But once we use propensity, the estimate became larger. This is an overall score and mathematics score. Once we condition everything on the propensity, we get much larger estimate. But four point increase, the score increased by four <coughs> in overall score, and the mathematics score shows even higher growth, five. And in a different method, we also get we also get the same similar results here. So this is the result from the two year panel. But the students are studying in elementary school for six years. So we can multiply this by three to get the six year impact, which is actually large. <coughs> if you use this, this number here, 3.8 or five, in mathematics, five points, times three to the 15. So student gain <coughs> score by 15, increase by 15, if they are in a cheap school, as compared to non team schools, students in non team schools, which is quite a large estimate. And I think you have a hand up. I know this, these numbers are too small. Yeah. <coughs> but we have a micro data, we collected micro data, investment data from each division. So we visited 23 divisions to 
threat, uh, deep investment, like the textbook distribution, the man hours in teacher's training, and also instruction training and subject training, and uh, school building pro process, new construction, of new generations. So we can estimate the component wise impact. <coughs> this shows. That's it. Uh, okay. This first graph, first second graph, this estimation uses data from both team and non team. And the second result is using, this estimation is using the data from only team. Both estimations show similar results. But interestingly, Grade 4 textbook impact is significantly large, while grade 5, grade 6 textbook impacts are insignificant. That means, going through from the grade 4 to 6, the initial stage in intervention is very important. If you intervene in grade 5 or 6, uh, it's going to be too late. We have to intervene. We have to have grade 4 students. If you want to get the long term, Probably this is true for grade one, two. Unfortunately, we don't have the data. We don't have the outcome data. National achievement test score for <laughs> grade one and two. Uh, and so that uh, we, this is uh, just uh, our conjecture, but the early intervention is always important. This is uh, one implication from our results. And instructional training, that's a theoretical training for teaching. The teaching method has significant positive impact. But subject to training, like English or mathematics or social science, whatever, those subject based training has a negative impact. Maybe there is a substitution effect uh, in terms of time allocation between the training time and the teaching time. I don't know when they were trained uh, and where, far away from school or nearby school. Also makes difference, but there is a contrast. Of, there is a contrast between the instructional training and the subject based. And the new construction of the school, I mean classrooms, has significant impact, positive impact. While innovation doesn't have any significant marginal impact, which also makes sense. So having a new classroom always helps children. Let me conclude, uh, <coughs> let me summarize what we found uh, in this study. We found significant positive impact of the TIP intervention on national achievement test scores. And if children are exposed to TIP, TIP type intervention for six years, the entire cycle of elementary school education, they, their score will increase 12 to which is large. And the larger impact on one's values. I don't know why. And the component effects are also interesting. If you look at the textbook impacts, we found early intervention is always important. If you intervene grade 6 and 5 is going to be too late, you better intervene help children grade 1 or 2, maybe. But right now that I'm just showing grade 4. And the training, school building. Well, I didn't show the impact of the SPM, school based management, because of the data issue. This is the soft component, which was introduced quite an early stage. And also, SPM, this kind of reform, governance reform, need longer time to show the impact. <coughs> because it's a kind of learning uh, process by parents, teachers, and community guys, and even local government. Um, we cannot expect the income to be materialized within one year, two years. Nobody takes a long time. And our data has also got on this issue. Let me uh, briefly <coughs> mention what actually 
we are doing now <laughs> as a part of my project. Uh, what I present <coughs> there is the first component of our study. Second component of our study, we are collecting uh, micro data from students and the households. We are collecting, we interview 3,000, or about 3,500 <coughs> students from eight divisions, eight provinces. Ifugao, Noiba Vizcaya, Ifugao is a team, Noiba Vizcaya is a non team. So they are couple, they are pair, okay, in the same region. And the Antike Iroiro, Nebras Oriental, Sebu, and they <coughs> there. And we sample uh, different cohorts. It's a grade 6, 1990-2000, which is a red team cohort. And to evaluate the team impact, we have a green team cohort, after team cohort, and grade 6 students in 2004 or 2006. We received individual test scores from a department of Department of Education is helping us quite a lot from the early stage, especially <coughs> under Secretary Dr. Pihano and the our team and the original <coughs> team are providing substantial assistance to us. And we also collected sibling data, siblings of our 3,500 students, on average household number, like six or seven, uh, seven uh, siblings, so that uh, the sample size is uh, 21,000. That's an uh, enormous information from which we have a lot of skills. And amazingly, we are tracking 3,500 students, individual and outdoor. To capture their schooling history and work history, job history, life history, to evaluate deep, deeper. Thank you very much, Dr. Yamauchi. Um, at this point, I would like to invite our audience to post your questions or your comments regarding Dr. Yamauchi's presentation. Uh, by the way, if you need to look at, take a closer look at Dr. Yamauchi's uh, presentation, it will be uploaded in the Circa website, in the Circa ABSS website later this week, as well as the paper that he has on this particular subject. Any questions or comments from our audience? Okay, so if there are no questions, Oh, yes, yes, sir. Um, I just want to understand a little bit on how you compare income by looking at nothing. What, what income did that introduce uh, in that bar uh, graph? Yeah, we use we use the census to have uh, income graphs. I believe uh, income class category, that data is based on census data, micro census data. That is not, of course, a statistical risk. It doesn't disclose uh, income level, low numbers. But uh, we use uh, income class categories, one to five. Nowadays, I saw it's uh, one to six. Income class category available from the National Statistical Office. From the National uh, uh, Statistical Office. But that, that is municipality level. So, municipality level income class categories. That is what we use. Per household? No, uh, it's a municipality average. Uh -huh. I, did, I, I, I think they, they pick some kind of average. At the municipality level, and then they define some special points to categorize them from one to six. One is the city town, and in two thousand census, it's a one to five. So five is the poorest, one is the richest. So it's a discrete data, discrete by. Yes. 
Can I, can I follow up? Yes. Because I, I understand that uh, in the choice of the deep and non deep uh, schools, the basis was whether the area is poor or not. Yes, so, by division. Yeah. Division of that. So I would expect that the tip uh, the tip income yes. should be a bit lower. Yeah, lower. Than yes, than non tip. Non tip, yeah. That is uh, our prior expectation. But if we if we look at the municipality level income levels, income classes. The distinction between a deep and a non deep is not really clear. It's a, quite a different from our prior expectations. Officially speaking, deep was implemented in the four provinces, what it is, school divisions. Yes. But even in the four deep divisions, and also the non deep divisions, within the division, there is an income distribution. We have a poor municipality to build very well, very well municipalities, even within the division. So, if we take a look at the, uh, I'm sorry, the municipality level distribution, like this, or school district <coughs> level distribution, the difference between the team and the non team is not really clear. So, this raises the issue of power. So, what was the actual real criteria in the government mind when they decide the two allocation, which is not really clear. Maybe it's because of the political process or whatever, something else. But okay, whatever happened at that time, now we are understanding the two thousand eleven and using a data. This kind of safety is good for us because they're comparable. So it's easy, easy to compare team and non team. Maybe this was a historical action, but uh, this is good for us, for researchers to evaluate team. team. But again, the targeting. Targeting is a big issue. What was the tar targeting allocation? Going back to the Policy implication of this. Um, if the government is going to use the uh, outcome of this study in, uh, in uh, uh, let's say, getting out assistance to schools, what would be the best strategy that they should be doing? Uh, well, they can use our study. They can use. They can trust our estimates. So, that with this kind of intervention. Children will gain a lot. Okay. We can quantify this. And given this estimate, they can target, clearly target to the poor schools, poor school districts, and divisions. I think that is what the government is supposed to do. <laughs> yes. But it didn't happen, at least in the Visaya region, that the strict targeting is not observed. It was more like, uh, I, I don't want to say randomized, but uh, it was the fact that deep and non deep were very compatible. Uh, yes, yeah, yes question, but uh, given the observations that I think all of us knew what was happening in the educational system in the Philippines, especially from the elementary to high school, you can almost, almost gauge that there is still a there is a big problem. I think you can see that there is a last lack of classroom, overpopulated uh, uh, schools, and so hardly you can identify which of these public schools are the best one. Almost it seems to me that the government should be giving all everybody assistance in terms of improving the school building, training of teachers, etc. <laughs> yeah, that, that is cost the best thing they can afford. And also uh, here in the Philippines, there is a unique issue. 
uh, in which is about competition between the private school and the public school. Historically, I see the private school dominates in terms of quality and screening good students. Maybe students from the well families first. So the subsidy to public school system is extremely important. Also in terms of the income of the distribution concept. So I kind of agree with you on this issue. Well, I also became curious now. Did you try getting data from the other class, the other regions you showed, and where that was there a lot of variation? Because this is Visayas, and you said yes. you know you chose this because you you think that there was not much variation. Yeah, we haven't looked at deep and not deep from other regions yet, but the data is available. Oh. Yes, it's in my computer. So oh. anyway, our team can analyze it. Well, probably it is the next step mm -hmm. to see the difference between Messiah and non Messiah and whether to answer Messiah is big representative or not. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, that's going to be a robust study. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.